Hello, everyone. So yeah, the slides are already up. Um, so good morning. This is election year again, right? Every two years we have this whole thing again. Um, so today I'm here to talk about the latest results we got from uh, security analysis of the Brazilian voting system last year. Uh, this is joint work with a whole bunch of people. Uh, Paulo Matias, Pedro Barbosa, Caio Ludes, and who am I forgetting? Uh, Thiago Cardoso, of course. So they are all around the country. They work in different universities and companies in other states. Um, and this was the team we composed to participate on the public security tests of the Brazilian Electoral Authority. So, but before we move to vulnerabilities in security analysis, I want to start with some context, because we may have foreigners in the audience. I think this is useful. So the first remarkable aspect of Brazilian elections is that elections here are huge. We have 140 million voters with a high turnout rate. So 81% of the voters actually show up to vote because voting is mandatory, right? So you, you actually get up and go there. Uh, elections are held every two years, so we alternate between federal and, and municipal elections. And the voting machines were first introduced in 1996. So about a, a fraction of the poll places had voting machines in the 90s, uh, and this was expanded gradually until all the polling places had, had machines. This happened in 2000. Another important and I think very different distinct uh, uh, characteristic of our elections is that the whole workflow is under responsibility of the same entity. So the electoral authority in Brazil, Supremo uh, Tribunal Eleitoral, Tribunal Superior Eleitoral, they are responsible for um, choosing the technology, writing the software, deploying the software, doing the logistics on the election day, collecting the results, publishing the results, uh, judging any dispute about the outcome, they do everything about elections which, as I will claim, create, create some sorts of conflicts of interest um, within the process, right? But this is very different from other countries where you usually have uh, the judicial system judging disputes about the results and a branch of the executive system actually doing the, the, the deployment phase of the election. So you all know this, right? This is the Brazilian voting machine we have on the left-hand side uh, the terminal that the poll officer uses to, to type the registration numbers for uh, voters or to collect fingerprints if your poll place is equipped with that. On the right hand side uh, you can find the, the terminal, the voter terminal, and I think the first interesting design flaw about this machine is that you can see a cable connecting the two. So the machine both collects the identity of the voter and his or her votes, which uh, is not the best security, the best design decision in terms of ballot privacy, right? Because then if the software is malicious, perhaps the software can record uh, the, the links between voters and votes. So in Brazil, we vote with numbers too, right? The candidates are, are identified by numbers. So that's why we have keypads on the voting terminal too. So this is not a touch screen machine as you find in other countries. So the machines were always claimed to be 100% secure, although this makes no sense, as you all know, right? So they were only first tested in 2012. Uh, on the first edition, I participated on these tests. I'll talk about uh, this later. Um, and that was the first edition also that we had access to the source code to inspect how the security mechanisms were implemented. So the hardware is manufactured by Debold, um, which you probably heard about uh, on the ATM uh, um, market or from voting machines deployed in the US. So there is a very interesting uh, documentary in the US called Hacking Democracy. It's, it's uh, produced by HBO. I highly recommend you to watch it. So it tells the story of how the source code of the Debold machines leaked in the internet and the, after, uh, the outcome after this. The technology has changed with time in Brazil. So in the 90s, they used a, a Brazilian operating system called Virtuos. They changed it to uh, Windows Compact Edition in the beginning of the 2000s. So we had presidential elections running Windows, right? Not the most, the brightest decision ever. In 2006, in 2008, many things changed. So they migrated to uh, Linux, a Linux distribution that's customized by the Electoral Authority. 
Uh, and also, uh, they took responsibility over the software development. So this was done before by uh, a company, uh, the Brazilian subsidiary of Debold, and now this is responsibility of the electoral authority. So if you want to blame them about, well, uh, blame someone about software vulnerabilities, you blame the electoral authority. They write the software, right? This whole fake news about like Venezuelan machines makes no sense. So this is important to, to, to tell you. Um, they experimented briefly with paper records in 2002 uh, after lots of pressure from the technical community. So some, a fraction of the voting machines in 2002 had what we call a VVPAT, it's a voter verifiable, verifiable paper audit trail. So you vote on the machine and the machine presents you a paper record with supposedly your votes and you get to confirm that. So that paper record stays on the poll place for a, an audit in case the result is disputed, for example. Currently, the biometric uh, enrollment initiative has reached half of the voting population, so they are, in the next few years, uh, they should enroll everyone and all polling places should have uh, fingerprints already. I will tell later on that we don't know how secure this biometric identification system is, but, well, it's been deployed. And since, one thing I have to say, since this is a paperless voting machine, so the voter has no way of uh, actually checking it, if the machine is recording their votes correctly, this is highly vulnerable against insider attacks. So someone who writes the software for the machines, for example, is of course in a privileged position to write malicious software or to coordinate with someone to uh, change the software uh, before it's installed in the machines, for example. So I'll talk about this too. So the algorithm for running elections in Brazil is quite simple. A few days before the election, uh, the software is installed. Um, a few months before the election, the political parties can, can audit or at least, at least try to audit uh, the, the software in the electoral authority. Um, it's very hard to audit the software because the, the code base is huge, so it's more than 24 million lines of code for every considering only the voting software for the machines, and we have half a million machines in operation during the, the election day. So at some point, the version of the software is, is frozen, and this version of the software is transmitted from the headquarters of the electoral authority to the regional branches, where it's recorded on these flashcards. So you can see at the top uh, of this slide, this is a flashcard used to install software in the machines before the elections uh, start. Each card installs 50 different machines, and this is important later on, so keep this number in mind. On the election day, who, who here has worked as a poll officer? Just to know, no one. Mesario, that's the word. So a few, a few poll officers in the audience. I, I never had the pleasure. I don't think I ever will have the pleasure. Um, so on the election day, between 7 and 8 a.m., the system is initialized, the machine is booted, and it prints what we call a zero tape. So it's a, a document with, uh, supposedly attesting that um, no candidates have votes before the election starts. Uh, of course, this only makes sense if the software is behaving honestly. It's just a paper with zero votes for everyone, right? So if it's the, it, this doesn't serve as proof that the vote, voting software is, is honest. At 8 a.m., the Paul officer should type a command on his terminal to unlock the machine so the voters can authenticate themselves with documents or uh, fingerprints and then uh, deposit, cast their votes. This goes on until 5 p.m., where again the poll officer types in a command to interrupt the voting session. And at this time, several things happen. One of them is that the machine prints a poll tape. So this is a collection of results for that polling place, right? All the votes for that specific machine. The machine also stores a bunch of files in a pen drive called a memory of results as a direct translation. You can see a picture of this on the bottom part of the slide. Um, these files include a log of what happened since it, the, the software was installed until uh, the voting session, voting session was interrupted. Uh, there is also an electronic version of the poll tape and a file called DRV, the digital rec record of the vote, that I will get to explain in more detail later on. This pen drive is then detached from the machine, attached to a desktop computer, and the contents are transmitted from that computer to the central tabulator. The tabulator um, essentially adds up all the partial results and declares the official outcome of the election. So this is the workflow in all polling places. I think the first actual independent attempt of analyzing the security of this machine uh, was the public security tests. 
So this was an event, well, it still exists, so it's, it's a current event that it's organized usually on the year before an election. The first edition was in 2009 without access to the source code, so the, the uh, attackers uh, there, the experts participating on this and tried to attack the machine, had to do black box attacking. Um, in 2012, I participated on the first uh, edition with access to the source code. But uh, the objective here is clear. So any experts participating should focus on trying to break the two main properties of any voting system, which are uh, ballot secrecy, breaking uh, the privacy of the voters, which in Brazil is a constitutional requirement. So the constitution mandates that the votes must be protected uh, by the electoral authority and the choice of technology, and ballot integrity, which basically means that your vote should not be changed between the time it was cast and the time it was counted and published as part of the official result. A problem with these public security tests um, after the four editions, and this is still recurrent, is that there are many restrictions for people participating. So all the participants must be pre-approved. As a participant, you must submit the, uh, the attack methods you want to, to try, and they must be pre-approved as well. Um, you have a few days to access more than 24 million lines of code, so it's, it's a lot of code to understand in just three days. You have four days, at least last year we had four days to uh, try to mount these attacks. Everything is extremely bureaucratic. So on the last edition, we had to fill multiple instances of eight different types of forms. And we had to fill a form to fill a form, which I think it's, it's novel. So you, you waste a long time just, you know, uh, gagging around these, these restrictions. We could not use pen and paper, so we couldn't take notes of the source code and bring them back to our, uh, uh, the place where we were working with the machine. Um, so we had to memorize uh, bytes and stuff to, to you know, just, just be able to, to mount attacks. So, uh, and there are no guarantees that this software version uh, being presented there is actually the latest or the correct one. We have just to trust uh, the electoral authority on this. So, I think this is the first example on the talk about the possible conflict of interest. For the participants, um, there is no, the impression is not that the electoral authority is actually attempting to allow participants to hack as much as possible uh, during the tests. You lose a long time, a lot of time just gagging around the restrictions. Still, um, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Electoral Court, the SEC, still claims that Brazil is the only uh, country to openly audit or allow hacking of its voting system. And I think it's important to um, tell that this is not true. So there are other countries doing better efforts, in my opinion. So Germany had, during CCC, had like a, a, a software for telling results available for hackers to, to attack. And also there is the voting village organized by DEFCON um, every year in the US where they actually openly allows anyone, openly allow anyone to uh, hack the machine. So there is a picture of the, the room there and there is someone from the electoral authority in this picture so they know that this happens, right? This is not, uh, uh, it's not something they don't know. But they still claim that Brazil is the only one, the only country allowing this to happen. To give some, some uh, context, on the right hand side of this slide, you can see a layout for the room where we worked on these tests. So you can see we were group one, so we occupied the first uh, table there. We, the, the computers with a version of the software, the source code, were on the back of the room. So we couldn't cross this room with paper notes. We couldn't just take notes of the software, portions of the software in the back of the room and come back to our table, our place of work. We had internet-connected connected, internet -connected computers on the right-hand side of the room uh, where we could access the internet. Fortunately, our machines were disconnected. Um, and at first, we could not take notes from the internet and bring back, which was very easy to circumvent. We just increased the zoom of the browser, right? So we could still see from our uh, place. Um, so on the last days, they relaxed this, this restriction, so we could take notes from the internet, but not uh, from the machines with the source code. All of these were behind the metal detector, so to prevent you from taking in a pen drive inside, uh, copying the whole software and submit it to WikiLeaks through Tor on the next day. I'm not giving ideas, I'm just reporting. <laughs> just reporting. Um, so in 2000, Trevor participated on this with a team, and at that edition, we found a very serious, in my opinion, vulnerability in how uh, ballot secrecy was implemented. So we found a way to reverse 
the vote shuffling mechanism. Um, this was not the only finding in terms of security of that edition. We also found uh, many sensitive cryptographic keys. These are sensitive secrets protecting uh, the system. They were hard-coded into the source code, which means they were, first of all, shared against or across all the machines, so half a million machines using essentially the same keys. And they were, of course, not uh, stored securely. They were just in plain text in the binaries because they were uh, hard-coded in the source code. In terms of uh, integrity checking, the mechanism was not very uh, uh, well designed either. So the voting software checks its own hashes or digital signatures to try to conclude if it has been tampered with or not, uh, which is just like trying to find out if you are crazy by not going to the doctor. So you say, oh, I, I will try if I'm I'll try to find out if I'm crazy by just myself. The problem is that you might be too crazy to figure out that you are crazy. So the software can perhaps be manipulated to not check itself again, right? And, and give the impression that all the checks were uh, correct. So the conclusions at that time were uh, the system did not provide ballot secrecy or ballot integrity. And this is very important for a paperless voting system because these security properties are uh, responsibility of the technology. We have no fallback to, to perhaps uh, reconstruct the correct result in cause of fraud. And from the point of view of development process, at the time we concluded that this was a direct consequence of an insecure uh, uh, methodology for writing software in the electoral authority, and also of lack of transparency. So if you lock programmers for more than a decade writing software that no one sees, you basically get insecure software at the end. They will be free to take uh, convenient but insecure design decisions that will impact security in the software. You, you, write, you probably wrote more software than myself in your whole lifetime, so you know exactly what I'm referring to. This is also, uh, we concluded it was also the, the Development process was uh, conducted on an inadequate adversarial model that disregards insiders. So the security mechanisms are not designed to resist an attack from someone who knows how they work. And I'll give evidence for that shortly. So this is the digital record of the vote. It was introduced uh, in, by a legal, legal mandate, so a law, uh, after the experience with paper records in 2002. So the electoral authority concluded that it was too expensive, too complicated, the printers jam in the rainforest and so on. So they decided to discontinue this. And instead of uh, trying to solve the engineering problems of paper records, they replaced the paper record with another digital record, which again makes no sense. Um, the idea is Count, the software counts the votes, but also stores these votes in a shuffled order, so it's not the original order they were cast, on this file. But the main problem is both files come from the same software component. So if the, if the software component is, of course, under malicious control, under the adversary control, you get frauded results in these two different files. They are compatible between each other, but they not reflect the intention of the voter. So this hypothetical uh, uh, election has three races. So the first voter, for, exa for example, uh, voted for 71 and no and 37 for president. You can see that his choices are mixed together with other votes. So uh, what this mechanism is trying to do is after you publish this file, this file is a public file, uh, you cannot reconstruct how the first voter, second voter, and third voter uh, voted, uh, and so on. This was presented in the opening talk of the public tests, and when they described this, I immediately thought that this was a promising attack vector because it requires random numbers. Shuffling things on embedded devices is hard. Generating random bits on embedded devices is hard. And so we knew that this, this could be an interesting uh, attack vector. You can see some gray cells there. The gray cells correspond to absentees. So if someone didn't show up to vote, you get a, a gray cell, an empty hole uh, in each column of this table. So when we learn about this, yeah, let's try uh, breaking up the random, the random number generation process. And, and since I'm a researcher in cryptography, of course, you do advanced cryptanalysis, right? Which is sophisticated statistics to detect biases in the way random bits are shuffled so you can reverse this. So, but before we tried like advanced stuff, we did this. So, because you have to start from the simple stuff, right? 
So we did this across the whole code base. It was literally the first thing we ran when we had access to the source code. This command took five minutes to finish. And then when it finished, we found a match in a file called drv.cpp, which, of course, has a very suggested, suggestive name. When we opened the file, we found this, which tells us how the seed was chosen. <laughs> So if you code in C, you know this is a horrible random number generator uh, seeded with a very insecure seed because it's deterministic, right? So at that time, we knew that there were only possible uh, 3,600 seeds because, well, these are the timestamps in seconds between 7 and 8 a.m. where the system is initialized. So we knew that we could try to find out if a seed is possible by just trying a timestamp, storing K out of N votes in a file, and see if the holes match it. If the holes match it, well, you have probably the right seed. But still, there are 3,600 seeds, so perhaps we have multiple seeds giving the same holes. So we need to find a way to disambiguate between seeds giving the same holes, right? The grade cells in the file. So we, we, when we actually figure out what timestamp uh, was used to seed this, we discovered that timestamp where the zero tape is printed was actually the information needed to uh, reverse the shuffling of the votes. So all the information needed to break ballot secrecy was printed in an official document. I had, I had the circle in red here, there just to make it easier to find. So this was ballot secrecy. Uh, this is not all. So the, the scenario, the text scenario here is the power officer perhaps records the order in which the voters voted. And then after the election, he knows the public information necessary to reverse the shuffling and recover the votes in order. Since he knows also the voters in order, he can match the choices and break ballot secrecy for everyone. But this is not all. There is more. So imagine, for example, that the, the president of the electoral authority voted at 11.20 uh, in 2010. And we know this is true because it's on the metadata of the picture of him voting, published by the, the electoral authority, so we know he voted at that time. Um, so the log file for the voting machines also stores the timestamps for each voter in order. So if you know that he voted at 11.20, you can figure out his position in the query. If you can recover the votes in order, you break ballot secrecy for the president of the electoral authority and a Supreme Court judge. We didn't do this because we would get in jail, uh, most probably, and this, it's profoundly uh, anti-democratic, I have to say. But the conditions are there, and all of this are, uh, is based on public files, so this could still happen. Don't try this at home, please. <laughs> Conclusions from that edition, we could, it was trivial to recover uh, uh, votes in order, or to recover the seed for um, votes out of order, or to recover a specific vote from someone very important. The recommendations at the time were to um, not to use a, a secure random number generation uh, algorithm and do not store metadata about the voters. A voting system should not store anything about the voters, in my opinion, to just to reduce attack surface. Otherwise, you have this effect where you break up, up the ballot shuffling mechanism and then this affects uh, um, ballot secrecy for a, a specific voter which votes in a certain timestamp. Instead, uh, they didn't comply with all the recommendations, so this was kind of fixed by using a custom algorithm. So the latest version of the software uses an algorithm uh, for random number generation uh, called Sephiroth, which is a, a weird algorithm from a researcher in Singapore, and he doesn't recommend that for cryptographic purposes, so it's not the best algorithm uh, either. But at least it's seeded with uh, entropy from the operating system, so this is better. It's interesting that uh, most voting machines have a hardware RNG that would play a better uh, role in, in generating random numbers, but not all of them have this device. So uh, the electoral authority claims that they cannot use this device because, well, not all machines have this, and they have, all the machines have to run the same software. So my conclusion is that the security of the, all the machines is defined by the worst machine in operation, the oldest one, because they can only implement in software or support in software uh, something that is present in all of the machines, which is not, again, a very wise design, design decision. So last year, we attempted to do something different. Instead of focusing on ballot secrecy, we focused on software installation as the attack vector. So if the adversary has control over the uh, 
install cards that I showed you before. Each card installs 50 different machines. What can this adversary do? This installation is done on a public ceremony. So you can see uh, pictures of the ceremony here. Um, in some cases, it looks more organized, at least from the records you can find on the internet. In some other places, it's not very well organized. In some pop places, school students visit and, you know, there's people from the outside participating on this. So we try to create this scenario where the adversary has access to these install cards during the software installation process. He tempers with the contents and then, well, the machines will run software that's different as originally programmed or, or distributed. So on, on the call for participation of the event, uh, the electoral authority explicitly said that researchers would not have access to cryptographic keys. Since I'm very naive, I thought that they had implemented some key management scheme that would take off all the cryptographic keys from the source code. That would be sensible, right? Uh, reality is, is never, it's always surprising, right? Never disappoints you. So we found out that actually just erased the keys from the source code. So the code base we had to inspect during the tests was not complete. They just deleted cryptographic keys from seven or eight different files. But uh, there is some justice in the universe sometimes. So this time we tried something slightly more sophisticated. <laughs> Grep is surprisingly useful when you don't have an access to like a compiler or anything uh, uh, minimally sophisticated. So we just grab it for uh, keys and then we find a match again. On a file called ue minix.c, so the encrypted uh, partitions of this install cards are follow the Minix format uh, and they are encrypted with AES and the key uh, is not very hard to find. It's hard coded directly in the software, exactly on the same place they were on 2012. So this is actually the first byte of the real key we found there. So one byte less of entropy. So when we got to that point, uh, we took a look at the, how the protection of the install cards work. So there are several different mechanisms that I'll, that I'll try to uh, give more technical details about. So uh, the cards are encrypted with AES-256 in XTS mode for the ones doing crypto. So this is a, a operation mode for, for disk encryption that was adapted to, to encrypt this file system. It's not the original specification either. They have a small change uh, that might impact security, but they have it. We have this in our report described in more detail. The key, as you saw, is embedded into the kernel. So it's, it's visible to anyone involved in the uh, development process. For integrity checking, there are different digital signatures computed by different components that are uh, using different algorithms, both in kernel mode and user land mode. So I have pictures describing this in detail. Uh, an important thing is the files that go into the memory of results at the end of the election are also digitally signed with keys stored in the install cards that are copied to the machine during the installation process. So if you break some of these mechanisms, you have also access to the keys that will sign the results that allow an attacker to fake results and have them validated by the uh, tabulator. So the encryption chain works like this. The bootloader uh, decrypts the kernel using uh, AES on the ECB mode of operation. The kernel has different sets of keys for the file system. Uh, that, that's the key I showed you on the, the previous slide. And another set of keys for encrypting the keys that sign results. All of them using AES under different modes. So we got the key on the left hand branch of that uh, in this slide. But if you reconstruct from the beginning, you might have all keys, right? For the authentication chain, things are slightly more complicated. So in the voting machines that have uh, MSD, MSD is a type of a kind of HSM, it's a security device that uh, is embedded into the motherboard and which contains the hardware RNG, one of the hardware RNGs available in the machine, the other one is in the processor. This device verifies that the, B, the BIOS is authentic and then this is what they call secure boot. The BIOS verifies that the bootloader is authentic through a digital signature. The bootloader verifies the kernel and so on. The kernel is modified to check that the binaries, both shared libraries and, and uh, executables are all signed with a valid RSA signature. So if the MSD did this function properly, you should transmit this authentication chain until you run the binaries. And there are 
also other signatures in detached files with extension VST, which are directly verified by the MSD. But again, only 75% of the machines have this MSD device, so this looks different on the older machines. Um, when we decrypted the cards, we could study how this worked, how this authentication chain worked, and then we figure out that there were two shared libraries without signatures in the VST files. So we tried to change them, right? If you have a piece of executable code that which integrity is not verified, you just inject your code to run there. That's what you do as an attacker. So we found two shared libraries, one dealing with log files, the other dealing with key, uh, cryptographic key generation. I'll talk about this uh, shortly. But these files didn't have any integrity checking mechanism. So the first thing we did was injecting code to, to print something in the screen, running the installation process as specified, and seeing that what we injected to be printed was actually printed. So we knew that at the time, we had already arbitrary code execution capacity over the machine. You still have to show how this affects uh, the security properties. It should be trivial for someone with a technical background. Perhaps it's not that trivial for someone who, for a layman. So we, we actually use this to exploit different parts of the system. Um, so for, for example, we changed the shared library dealing with log files to, to corrupt the log file, to show that if the software is not authentic, the log files do not serve to audit the software. Again, this should be trivial, but it's important to demonstrate in practice, I guess. Um, for the shared library dealing with the DRV, we did something interesting. So the DRV is also stored on the external flashcard that the PAW officer can extract during the, the voting session. And it's stored in encrypted form to prevent this from happening. Suppose that someone very important is going to vote. So the PAW officer extracts this card and takes the DRV file, a copy of this file, gives the card back to the machine, run another vote, and then takes another version of the file. By computing the differences between these files, of course, you reveal the votes for this specific voter. To prevent this from happening, this file is encrypted with a key that's generated dynamically by the voting software. So we changed the software to use all zeros as the key, because we could inject instructions to run there. So we could decrypt the file and break ballot secrecy for this specific voter in a real election if this, you know, the same vulnerabilities were uh, present there. We also plugged in a USB keyboard just to type stuff and print to the screen because it, it was fun. Um, we also uh, found out on the last day that the voting software, that application that we used to cast our votes, was linked against these libraries, which means that we could inject code on the libraries to modify portions of the voting software to run malicious activities, right? So you could think of tampering with the screen contents, perhaps, uh, or moving votes from one candidate to the other, or preventing votes from being stored. Well, you are technically writing the software for the machine by this mechanism. So you could, you could do anything with this. That's what we call arbitrary code execution. So to illustrate, uh, this is a screenshot of the simulator for uh, the, the voting software that's available on the internet. So what we did was inject code to prevent or, or to modify this that string on the top version of the slide. So you can see seu voto para, your vote goes for. In this case, this is a simulation. So someone is voting for swimming for the president. That's how the, the simulator works. So we changed that uh, string to vote 99, perhaps to tell a voter to vote for a specific candidate. And in this case, a not very democratic one. So we also found uh, how to prevent votes from being stored in the machine. We found exactly the piece, the portion in the program that was responsible for storing the votes. And we prevented that from being executed. And when we simulated an election, uh, the machine triggered an error saying that no votes were stored, which was exactly what we expected. So after we found exactly the point where we could move, store votes, the next attack, the final attack we had was move, moving votes from one candidate to the other. The problem is the tests were interrupted at 6 p.m. on a Friday without any delay. So we were installing the software in the machine to perform this attack. This was interrupted and, and we didn't have a chance to finish. But I don't mind too much about this because we had arbitrary code execution and we knew exactly what to, to inject uh, in the voting software to, to provoke this behavior. So conclusions. The install cards were not properly encrypted. The keys were just hard-coded in the software. Uh, the integrity checking, again, was also insecure. Uh, the authentication chain just stopped at some point. 
right? Uh, and didn't preserve the properties until the binaries and shared libraries uh, because someone forgot to sign them. And there was also a bug in the kernel code that would validate all signatures um, for the shared libraries at least. And so far, this attack relies on having access to the source code to capture these cryptographic keys. But another team of forensic experts who work for the federal police, they found on the, the, the last day um, another way to the same keys. So they could boot the voting software, the install card in a virtual machine, and the execution proceeded until we could see the key we, we obtained it from the source code in the memory layout of the virtual machine. So this means that at some point, the attacker could just simulate the, the voting machine and capture cryptographic keys for both the file system and the authentication keys for the results from the memory layout. So this makes an alternate version of this attack fully external, doesn't rely on access to the source code uh, anymore. So again, our recommendations were just automate the signing process, do not rely on the developers to remember that they need to write to sign the new files coming up in the system due to refactoring and so on. Um, and also fix the problem in the kernel to verify the signatures that was not working correctly. And to deploy some proper key management. These this machines should not have insecure keys stored in, in the plain text or share all keys across all machines. Because if a key leaks somewhere, you have a nationwide impact. This could be used to attack the system anywhere else. Instead, they did something slightly different, which was uh, sharing the same key across, keeping the, the massive sharing of the same key across all machines, but not storing them hard-coded in the software anymore. So these keys are now computed dynamically by the voting software using a secret that's stored in the BIOS of the machines since the 90s, as they claim. Um, this makes the system slightly more robust against an external attacker who might not be able to dump the BIOS or reverse engineer the software to understand how this combines, uh, but still maintains the system insecure against an insider because they have access to the, you know, to the voting software to print this machine on the, on the screen at any time. So not an ideal uh, uh, solution either. An ideal solution would be to generate these keys on a security perimeter and have the keys to ne never leave the secure device ever. Hopefully they will implement something like this when all the machines have uh, the MSD support. Problems we still have. So software by all purposes is secret for more than 20 years. The only uh, entities capable of inspecting the source code are the political parties. Uh, universities can recommend uh, inspectors and, and some other institutions from the judicial system. All of these entities have to sign and comply an NDA, which means that uh, they have months to inspect the source code, but they cannot disclose the results afterwards. In this, fortunately, in this test, we didn't have an NDA in place, or, or the NDA had a very limited scope. It only uh, it expired as long as the reports, or right after the reports were made public, which I think is sensible. But the longer um, window for inspecting the source code is still still has this NDA limitation, which I think it's incompatible to many uh, researchers who want to inspect the code. Software was this demonstrated to be insecure but in different occasions. I talk about the tests here, two different editions of the tests. Since this is a paperless voting system, there is no possibility of a recount. Recount is just pressing a button and getting the same result. This is not what we call a recount. A recount for elections must have a non-zero probability of producing a different result, which might be the correct one. There are also no ways to effectively audit the system. You have to try to understand more than 20 million lines of code, and the system doesn't provide evidence on election data that's working properly and correctly, and honestly, more importantly. So um, this is a severe limitation and doesn't satisfy, of course, uh, the security properties we consider for voting systems. There are conflicts of interest everywhere here. I mentioned a few of them, but you, you can think of others. And internal attacks, uh, insider attacks, are still completely disregarded um, in the design of the system. So to finish this talk on a more constructive point of view, what can we do? In my opinion, we should follow the exper experience in other countries and the scientific consensus on this. 
which is to help deploy voter verifiable uh, paper records everywhere. This shouldn't happen on a single election. A gradual implementation of this would make more sense logistically. But we need to find a way where voters can verify that the machine is behaving correctly. And this record stays in the poll place for an audit or a recount. So this must be followed by a protocol to process this paper record. It would be interesting if, if the voting software is published for transparency. This doesn't solve all problems if, if the voting software becomes open source, because it's still hard to verify that the software you inspected at home was installed in the machine you are using to vote. Right? So there is a long uh, um, path between these two things, and it's hard to verify that no, no modification was done between these two uh, steps. But it, should be, it would be really important to allow the technical community to inspect the source code and press for better design decisions. That's what we can do with open source software. I think that we also need some ways to improve the social control over the system. So it's hugely centralized right now due to uh, the, the centralization of powers in the electoral authority. We need better ways to allow society to contribute to this effect. After all, elections serve society and not the par political parties or the electoral authority. Elections are designed to serve us, essentially. And I, I sincerely think that the technical community should be much more vocal, vocal about this. And there are not many experts in the country um, analyzing and getting involved with the security of the system and brutally uh, in a, describing the results in a brutally honest way afterwards. We need more people doing this and contributing to make the system more secure and push for transparency. So you are all part of the technical community. This is your duty to as you know, a Brazilian citizen who understands how this works. And I think in an election that will probably be the most polar polarized in our history, having an independently verifiable uh, voting system is extremely important. And thanks a lot for your attention so far. I might have a minute to answer one question. Thank you. Do we have time for one question, perhaps? Two questions, Two questions even better. I can replay the question to the audience if I can hear it. Or if, oh, we have extra microphones. Questions? One there. Hello. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I just wanted to ask the question. The same machines are being borrowed on some sort of a scheme to the different countries. Do you know how different the procedure of securing them is from what you presented? Okay, so not this one. This one is only used in Brazil. It was, uh, uh, I think, a, just a few countries, Paraguay may be one of them, and there might be a second one in Latin America that borrowed these machines for one of their elections, but quickly returned them um, right after because they figured out that, well, they could not verify the results. So these machines are only used in Brazil. This is a specific model. There are a few other places using paperless voting systems. So you probably have seen the whole discussion in the US. Um, more specifically from last week is the state of Georgia. And I find it very interesting how the discussions are different. So in the US, you find the judicial system pushing for paper records in their elections. In Brazil, Congress approved the law to mandate paper records in this election for at least a fraction of the, of the voting machines, but the Supreme Court considered this law to be unconstitutional. So the debates are remarkably different. I don't understand why, probably conflicts of interest in our case. Uh, but just to clarify, these machines are only used here. The use of voting machines in the planet I think it's, get, it's, it's decreasing with time. Many countries are realizing that they don't need this because they have small elections without fraud. So why are you spending so much time doing this? So, so much money buying the machines and so on. Uh, and some of them are actually reverting to paper ballots. So the situation varies a lot by country, but only a few, perhaps just five states in the US continue to use paperless uh, voting machines. All the other countries have paper records for recounts and audits. Thanks for the question. I don't think anyone would want to borrow this machine, but that's just me. Uh, I have another question I, I there. I saw someone just, okay. Yeah, there. Uh, 
Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. It was very good. Um, this year, I will be uh, participating from this election as Mesario. And uh, they said that this year they have an uh, audit happens everywhere. They will select some machines randomly. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't know, I don't have uh, any information how this audit happens, if it's just printing a paper as they already have it. And uh, how does you help uh, improve the security? And uh, is two questions you can answer okay. this one. But the second one is uh, how how they can uh, bring to us uh, the possibility to uh, for the voters um, have the the. Uh, Make sure that the, the, this vote was counted without to uh, break the, the secrets of the, the election. Maybe blockchain can be a possibility to. Uh, I was you know. I was just waiting for blockchain to come up. It, was, <laughs> it, would, it would have to, right? Great. So actually, uh, blockchain technology is a very bad decision for protecting votes because, well, if you are uh, online updating individual votes on the blockchain, this means that other voters can do partial tallies and influence the result, or political parties can do this, anyone can do this, right? If they are encrypted and this key leaks somehow, then you can uh, go back and check all votes at different timestamps and metadata to break ballot secrecy. So blockchains are not a very good technology for storing individual votes. They might be good for storing poll place results because they are public information anyway, so they might have some, some uh, participation there. Um, so we have a, a, a website, urnaeletronica.info, that you can go up and check a, a frequently a set of frequently answered uh, questions for um, some arguments against blockchain voting, which are consensus uh, among the experts. For the f uh, for the voters to be able to verify the results, uh, paper records are the only accessible technology because any voter without sophisticated uh, training can verify that the vote is casted as intended. That's the, the term we use in, in the scientific literature. And for your first question, uh, there are some audits that are done. One is called parallel voting, where they simulate the election um, to, in the, at the same time, uh, and they try to, by verifying that the machine be behaves correctly in this simulation. It probably is also being honest on the real uh, election, but there are ways in which the voting software can detect if it's being simulated or running in a real election and, and be honest in only one of these occasions. To give a small hint, remember the Volkswagen case where you know the emission of pollutants was different and the, the, the microcontroller would find out if it was being tested or not. So software can figure out if it's uh, being tested. So we, this would be a way to circumvent the parallel voting. The Electoral Authority also announced that there would be something called real-time real audit, which is uh, just before the election starts, they check the hashes that the files are still correct. But the problem is this is done by the voting machine. So if the machine is compromised enough, to uh, replace the files and the hashes that will be printed in the screen, this will give the impression that everything is uh, authentic when it's not in reality. So there are no meaningful ways to audit the system or the voting part of the system, of the process. What you can do is collect information about the poll tapes, which are public documents, um, and verify that they were transmitted correctly at the end of the election by checking the digital poll tapes published by the election authority three days after. Anyone can do this, do this for your poll places as a poll worker or not. And I think it's a good idea also to stick to 5 p.m. just to, to kind of push the poll officer to finish the voting session on time so he doesn't have the idea of you know, voting for absentees and things like that, which we know happen. Thanks a lot for your question. Thanks a lot for your attention. See you sometime somewhere. Thanks.